maybe three is where we started on, and then I was bringing in all these people in the waiting room. Hi, panelists. Just to say, we're going to um, push our we're going to push our timer to Zoom and let in the people from the waiting room. So anything we talk about now will be heard by the audience. everyone and a warm welcome to the third global policy dialogue exploring the future of the world this time focusing on the future of our planet thank you for tuning in from wherever you are to follow this event which is organized by the united nations department of economic and social affairs undesa and the united nations development program undp with the support of the un peace and development trust fund my name is Aminda Lee. I'm a British and Italian journalist and moderator specialising in environmental topics. So I'm especially delighted to be chairing the discussions today, which are going to touch on topics such as climate science, 
youth and climate action, and policies for environmental preparedness. Obviously, the whole subject of the future of our planet is very much in the forefront of people's minds right now. After all, it comes a month after the UN Sustainable Transport Conference in Beijing and less than a week after the conclusion of the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, in Glasgow, which saw young protesters marching to demand urgent action. After final late night negotiations and last minute changes, 197 countries eventually agreed to call for the use of unabated coal to be phased down and there were other agreements to prevent deforestation and to reduce methane emissions among other things. But will all these announcements keep us to our Paris Agreement goal of limiting global temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius? Well, we have several excellent speakers here to shed some light on the future of our planet over the next 90 minutes. This event is part of the Future of the World series that is designed to share insights and experiences to reduce risks and to make our future systems more resilient. UN DESA has also launched a collection of Future of the World policy briefs connected to the series. For example, a brief on wildfires is now available to read at the address that you will be able to see on the screen in a moment. It's un.org stroke DESA and you can find them all there. In a moment, I'll explain how today's dialogue will run. But first, there are a couple of practical announcements for you. English captions are available in Zoom and Facebook by clicking on the captioning icon on the bottom of your screens. Live captions in the UN's six official languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian and Spanish, are also available on a separate website with a case sensitive link to access it provided on the bottom left hand side of your screens, bit.ly captions 18 nov. Once you're on the website, just select the language you want from the drop down menu. And of course, you've probably all seen that this event is also being provided in American Sign Language too. We encourage you to spread the word on what you hear today on social media using the hashtag Future of the World, which is also posted on the right hand side of your screen for a handy reminder. The other important thing for you to know is that today's dialogue actively involves you, the audience, with plenty of opportunities to interact and to question our panellists. In fact, you can send in your questions, vote on other people's questions and answer polls by scanning the QR code on the right hand side of the screen to access something called Slido. Or, if you prefer, just launch the Slido, go to slido.com and insert the future of the world code displayed at the bottom right hand side of the screen. Though remember, it is case sensitive. When you log on to Slido, you'll see there are already some questions there, which were sent in by people when they registered. Please vote for your favourites. I'll be trying to go to the ones with the most votes first. Now, as you know, today we're starting, we're talking about the future of our planet. And I'd like to start off by asking you a question in our first poll. And the question is, what is the biggest threat posed by climate change? All you need to do is put in your answer and then press send. You can send in multiple answers, try and keep them to one or two words if you can. And if you like the answer someone else has sent in, you can send it in as well and the word will get bigger. I'm going to leave those on the screen uh, for a while and let you vote uh, to see uh, what the biggest threat is. Um, and we'll have that open and we'll look at the results in a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to start by introducing you to our panelists. We are joined by Ronald Jackson, who is head of the Disaster Risk Reduction Recovery for Building Resilience team at the UN Development Programme, who's tuning in from Switzerland. Hello. We have Monoro Takada, the team leader of sustainable energy at UNDESA, who's logging in from the USA. Hello. Nice to be joining. Then we have Adinike 
Olaha Duso, who is Ambassador for Earth Uprising and the African Youth Climate Hub, who's joining us from Nigeria. Say hello. Hi. Hello. Then we have Hi. Then we have Sonali McDermott, who is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at New York University. She's also obviously tuned in from the United States. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. Joining from Germany, we have Joanna Post, who is Program Officer and UN Ocean's Focal Point at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. Hello. Hello there. And we have John Christensen, who is co-editor of the UN Environmental Programme Emission Gaps Report, who is logging in from Denmark. Yes. Hello, everybody. Welcome. OK, well, we're going to be hearing from all of them in a moment. And I'm just adding in my answer to the uh, poll that we have uh, going on. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, I'd like to see your poll. We haven't had that many answers, but if we could have a look and see what uh, the answers are to your poll. We have desertification, desertification, uh, which is the top thing that you think is the threat from climate change. Uh, we also have sea level rise, food safety, that's interesting, something we're touching on in one of our panels. Migration, yes, of course, uh, if nations are underwater, they have to go and live somewhere else, their populations. Uh, floods, it's also becoming bigger in there too. Uh, extinction, uh, yes, uh, that's a pretty drastic one. Perhaps we may even be discussing that uh, uh, in the near future. Uh, and then we also have drought and we have inflation as well, which is an interesting, of course, the economic side of it all. So thank you for voting in that poll. I'm now going to close it, but uh, don't go, uh, don't switch off Slido because we'll be coming to plenty more soon. Um, so as I mentioned earlier today, we aim to move the discussions on from COP26. But first, I want to actually run another poll now um just while you're getting in the mood uh, let's see if we can get more of you logged on use the qr code that you can see on the screen and this poll this time i want to know how you judge the outcomes of the cop 26 climate talks and we have various options for you uh, we have heading in the right direction some progress but action must be faster uh, we have better than nothing too little, too late, or as Greta would say, all blah, 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 and nothing more. So here are the, uh, the polls. Please answer, send in your answer, and we'll see which one comes out uh, on top in a moment. You've got a little bit of time to cast your votes. So I'm going to leave that voting uh, while we start with an exceptionally popular video released ahead of COP26 by our co-host UNDP intended to inspire climate action at every level. I'm not going to spoil it, but it involves a very unusual, highly passionate speaker. Okay. You need a minute? Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. And let me tell you, and you'd kind of think this would be obvious, going extinct is a bad thing. And driving yourselves extinct? In 70 million years, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. At least we had an asteroid. What's your excuse? You're headed for a climate disaster. 
And yet every year, governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now! Think of all the other things you could do with that money. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? Let me be real for a second. You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic, this is humanity's big chance. So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you. Well, as I said, extinction was going to be coming up. Thank you to Frankie the Dino for that very timely reminder that we don't want to become extinct, especially through our own actions. And thanks to UNDP for sharing Frankie's message with us. It certainly resonated with me. So let's get to the discussion now and see what you think in, uh, about the results of COP26. And let's see the answers to the poll. Uh, and so for the number one leading uh, answer is some progress, but action must be faster with 54% of people uh, who voted uh, choosing that option. That's good. I, I, it's actually interesting to see that no one has chosen all the, all the blah, blah, blah. So it's actually perhaps more positive than we've been hearing in some of the newspapers. Um, now, during this session, we're going to be focusing on three specific topics related to the future of our planet. But we want you to choose the order that we're going to be discussing them in. We're putting the agenda in your hands. And so to do that, I'm afraid we're back with another poll. This one's a very easy one, uh, which is which is the topic that you're most interested in? Uh, and the three topics that we're going to be discussing this afternoon are policies for environmental preparedness, climate science and youth and climate action. So please cast your vote and then what we will do is we will follow in the order of the ones with the most, starting with the most votes and going to the least votes finally. So please do cast those votes while I explain how the rest of this session is going to run. Each topic will start with a short conversation with our experts in that field, followed by some time for a couple of your questions on that topic. So do send them in right away. And after we've uh, talked about all three topics, there'll be a lightning round of quick fire questions to cover things that may not have come up earlier. Remember, you can vote on other people's questions and of course you can relay uh, what you're thinking of these discussions and what you're hearing here on social media using the hashtag Future of the World. So I've not had much time, but I really want to get back down and start talking about and hearing from our panelists. So I'd like to now close the poll and let's see what you voted for first. And it looks to me like uh, policies for environmental preparedness is number one. And then, oh, uh, you, you took the poll off. I couldn't see it. So then we have youth and climate action number two and climate science number three. So great. We will start with uh, policies for environmental preparedness. And in fact, the concept of environmental preparedness covers two different kinds of policies. And to different kinds of preparation. First is that we need action on reducing climate change, so stopping emissions of dangerous climate altering gases like carbon dioxide and methane. And then we have to prepare for the changes that are already underway in our climate and will happen whatever measures we do to reduce future emissions. In fact, the world is already 1.1 degree warmer than in pre-industrial times, and that's raised seas, sparked wildfires, fires and threatened water availability for millions of people around the world. So how do you think we need to prepare? And now I would like to start this section with a quick poll uh, and asking you which area should be a priority for policies to prepare us for the environment to come. And as you can see, you have various options. They are infrastructure, agriculture, emergency warning systems and funding for developing countries. 
I'm going to leave that poll open for a little bit and introduce the speakers for this panel. We have Ron Jackson in charge of disaster risk reduction at UNDP and Minoru Takada from the sustainable energy team at UNDESA. Please send in your questions during these discussions. Uh, don't wait until the end uh, and risk your risk missing out. And do vote on the questions that you like the most. Uh, we're going to be going to those with the most votes first. So let's close our poll uh, and see what you think. Uh, can we see the results on the screen? Uh, and we have, um, so number one, we have funding for developing countries with 42%. Then we have energy, interesting, with 26%. Agriculture, 16%. We'll be hearing a bit more about agriculture in a moment later on. Infrastructure and emergency warning systems. Very interesting there. Okay, well, let's close that poll. Uh, and I think I'd like to uh, start off with Ron. Uh, first of all, what's your reaction to those results? And what do you think our priorities should be when we prepare for environmental preparedness? Ron? Can you hear me? Okay, Ron doesn't seem to be able to hear me. Uh, so I will ask you, Min uh, Minoru, what, uh, what do you think about that poll? I agree with the poll, actually. Um, I think uh, the, the may, they may look like an incremental step from the overall picture's point of view. Like you said, uh, we're heading toward 1.1 uh, already. And if trajectory goes as is, it goes beyond two, uh, two degree for sure. But at the same time, if you sort of try to aggregate uh, what the government, businesses, civil society said uh, during the COP26 or leading up to it, uh, there is a chance that you know, we could put uh, uh, our world uh, the, on the trajectory below two degrees prospect. This is for the first time that happened in the history of the, you know, all, uh, the climate discussions. So uh, I would certainly sort of agree here. Uh, clearly, this is a good news, but the bad news is that it's probably not sufficient. So uh, we clearly need to do more. Uh, where do we need to do more? Uh, the A, uh, the query on the part of reducing emissions, we have to accelerate here. Um, there's a good news here is that you know, renewable energy is really booming. Uh, it has been booming last decade and it's continued to sort of dominate the power sector for, for the time being to come. So uh, this is getting, you know, uh, probably the least uh, the cost, uh, least sort of costly option in across the world, almost all the prices. So we'll be able to see a massive investment in renewable energy, and this is going to displace uh, many of the traditional conventional options. So this is a very good news to come. But news is that uh, I think, you know, phasing out of, you know, existing dirtier, uh, you know, uh, more carbon intensive uh, fossil fuel options, uh, the transition might take some time. Uh, as you could see that COP26 came out short of saying the phasing out of coal and fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, unfortunately, Frankie's sort of wishes has not been fully granted. Uh, but at the same time, this is the first time in the COP discussion that energy, uh, coal, fossil fuel, these terms entered into the former text. So you can see that the you know, governments are certainly receptive uh, of the idea of trying to transition quite aggressively uh, more sustainable, cleaner, cleaner energy system. And the question is going to be, how fast can we do it? And this is where I think the question of finance will come. Uh, there then, I again, you know, uh, the, I agree with the poll that, uh, that we have to do much faster and much larger that. $100 billion uh, that was promised some time ago by developed countries for developing countries is getting closer, but not there yet. And obviously, if you look at the total financing need, let's say, for example, in the area of energy alone, we have to at least triple investment in renewable energy and energy efficiency over the next de de decade to come uh, for us to be able to be uh, on the path to the net zero emissions next 30 years. So you can see that the magnitude of challenge we're looking at it here. Uh, but quite importantly here, developing countries 
But I think they, there is a reason that they could be a little disappointed this time uh, in the sense that you know, uh, they have not got what they really need to be able to transition, whether it is about energy system or infrastructure that needs to be compatible with you know, or the, you know, or the climate resilient and net zero emissions systems or whether to sort of adapt to the changing climate, which is inevitable, uh, there's a sort of huge sort of need for investment, upgrading the infrastructure, upgrading the entire systems. And obviously we have to change the behavior patterns, for example. Those things require significant policy changes and financing. So obviously there's tons of things to be done, but I tend to agree with everybody again here. Yeah, I am on the optimistic side for the first time, probably in a you know, few sort of years of the COP negotiations. And then I look forward to sort of having more to come uh, in the future COPs. Thank you. Uh, that's it's good to hear actually some someone feeling positive because uh, you know then sometimes we hear a lot of negative voices. Um, so so it's good to actually hear that. Um, Ronald, you keep coming and going. Um, you obviously have a kind of connection issue. Uh, I was going to come to you and then you suddenly went black on me and, um, and I, we can't see you anymore. It's just a, a square with no, uh, no person, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, Minoru, I'm going to uh, just continue uh, just talking to you a moment while, uh, while we try and get Ronald's connection back. Um, but Ah, Ronald. I oh no, <laughs> he's obviously Ronald. Can you can you hear us? Can I'm you hearing you now. I'm hearing you now. Okay, great, great. Don't move your phone, um, and and let's try and, uh, and and get you while we can, as it were. Um, so we were talking. What what? Uh, I don't know if you managed to see the poll uh, that we ran, where most people were saying that one of the big things we need is obviously funding for development, developing countries. Uh, but then we had energy coming next. And the last one at the end was emergency warning systems. Uh, someone who's interested in disaster uh, risk reduction may be interested in that fact that emergency warning systems seem to be such a low priority. Uh, what's your reaction? Well, well, I think, I mean, certainly the top three that you've raised in the polls are that you see coming through in the polls are very important. And I think they're all linked, um, you know, financing, certainly has been seen as one of the main issues coming out of out of not just this cop but past cops and um you know remains one of the big challenges around how are we going to finance our way out of out of the challenges we're facing if we are you know small island developing states who are perhaps at the forefront of this challenge and so uh, the, the the energy conversation really is about how do we use that as an opportunity to one, invest in, in renewable energies, but then unlock resources um, based on the high cost we're spending on, on fossil, fossil based fuels that can then go into financing some of the other areas of public goods, such as the early warning systems. So I think that's, that's certainly one of the area of policy um, from, from UNDP side that we're looking at. How do we invest in energy, but how do we also look at the financing streams, or are we creatively looking at financing streams, but are we are also trying to address this issue of, you know, you, you mentioned um, emergencies and disaster risk and early warning. I think we need to move a little bit more in our, in our thinking around understanding the relationship between risk and development. So one of the, the policy areas UNDP is, is looking at and very much linked to this outcome of the COP and the loss and damage conversation is how are we, we taking a much more multidimensional look at a risk-informed development approach? What are we seeing? Um, how are we looking at harmonizing our risk language so that we're, we're on the same page, not just in terms of the, the, the UN system, but also national governments? You know? So here, um, you know, issues around circular economy and how we can bring or or what i call our unsustainable practices out of the way and and giving way to to more sustainable approaches we've become so dependent on these unsustainable practices and it is these practices that are actually creating new risk sustaining all risks and creating new risk which is which is leading us into this this current spiral and why frankie is talking to us about trying to move away from, from you know, approaches that are leading us into extinction. 
How are we then looking at this as a means of promoting green jobs and incentivizing not just current entrepreneurs, but future entrepreneurs? So in our business schools, how are we, how, how are we now bringing the, the mindset to thinking about going out in the world and, and investing in green jobs? Um, ecosystems, and, and I'm bringing these up because these are central to our conversation around resilience. If we're going to build resilience, if we're going to finance public goods such as early warning system, we have to create spaces for that um, since finance remains a big problem. So valuing our ecosystems and ecosystem services such that the, the sale and use of such in, an, in, an, in a negative way becomes prohibitive. You know, that's one, one, one way of thinking about this. And then issues around how we are designing our policies. And this is coming back to the risk-informed approach. How are we using risk information, risk analytics, and blending that with you know, foresights, not necessarily in a linear way, understanding what our trade-offs are from our policy choices, and then begin, beginning to look at our funding models that are you know, able to resource that pathway uh, towards the future. So UNDP is in fact engaged in a number of these areas in supporting our governments on building you know, sustainable energy solutions, looking at early warning systems and rolling out a risk-informed development approach. But I want to get a little bit under that policy speak and to really bring us to some of the, the issues around how we may want to think differently towards breaking that cycle of unsustainable practices. It's, it's actually the way you I hope you're able to hear me it. well, given the... Yes, no, we can hear you absolutely fine. Thank you. Um, very interesting what you talk about, because in the end, we're talking about a whole redrawing of everything that we do. And often up until now, um, all the different areas are in their little, you know, there's the, the there's the environment in one side and there's the, uh, you know, energy in another and and things don't really people don't really talk to each other and don't look at it in that holistic way. Um, Minoru, do you think this is also a, a problem? Is this something that you see, for example, in energy? Absolutely. Uh, um, after all, I think any interventions, you know, in the case of energy, it is less, you know, there tend to be the technological interventions, uh, will have to benefit the societies. And then I think, you know, our uh, end game here is that what type of services that we'll be able to provide for economy to grow and for people to live, you know, our dignity life and to be able to serve, you know, on the support sustainable system for our future generations. So that's what we are actually working on those things. For that, you know, it has to be sort of, you know, a whole of society approach to come. Let me say, so there's three things here, important here, right? So one is that, you know, uh, we don't know yet exactly uh, which solutions are going to be most effective. And then we're looking at sort of next 30 years to get to net zero and to be able to completely adapt to the changing climate. So innovation is going to be central uh, moving forward. So whether it is energy technology or infrastructure, whether it is sort of new sort of you know, crops to be able to adapt to the changing climate and those things, anything, those require a lot of innovations. So this is going to be a central topic for everybody to be able to sort of you know, discuss at the country level, but also global cooperation is going to be needed. And the second point is that uh, the, we cannot leave anyone behind here. So uh, any sort of you know, climate change related intervention cannot actually sort of you know, increase and widen the inequality that exists in country and globally. So uh, here then it is going to be extremely important to see how any intervention, let's say, on the energy side will be creating equal opportunities for developing countries in terms of job creations, for example, or investment in the new technologies, research and uh, the development capabilities, or education facilities, all those things that systemic sort of foundation that enables innovation that leads to the growth in a sustainable fashion would have to be looked at. And of course, these things will have to also come with a number of other issues, which are all captured around sustainable development goals, famous 17 SDGs. And then this is going to be a very important thing, test here, right? As we so much push and invest in the climate solutions, which tended to be millions 20 years ago, 10 years ago, billions, we're talking about trillions, trillions of dollars. Look at it here, right? SDG alone, achieving SDG required 
about you know, 2.5 billion to 3.5 trillion dollars of investment gap annually. Now climate financing is gonna come to climate solutions on the order of trillions on the annual basis. We ought to look at the implication of climate solutions on the systemic level across all SDGs, whether it is social, women's employment, to the poverty reductions, health services, water, energy solutions, innovations, oceans, sustainable consumption, those things. All those things are going to be linked. We cannot disassociate. So then I think an important point here and a message to the young folks as well here. It's very good that they actually demand transparency and accountability on the part of the climate solution and financing on those things. But they should not forget that the results part of it. I think we should equally demand what are the sort of results that climate financing and the solutions investment actually sort of making in terms of meeting and progressing toward SDG by 2030. So I propose that you know, 2030 SDG should be part and parcel of this discussion. And I think you know, we need to continue to monitor this one side by side with the climate solutions moving forward next 30 years. Back to you. Thank you. Ronald, what's your reaction in this, in this uh, part of the, the puzzle, as it were? So, sorry, could you repeat, repeat the, the question? Um, so what do, you, what do you think we're talking about this holistic approach and the need to have, um, you know, it's important to have joined up thinking. Uh, and we've also yeah. heard the importance of innovation as well. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? And also no, linking I, I mean, disaster no, risk to with. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think that that is exactly at the heart of my earlier offering that, you know, we really have to, to really approach this in a holistic way. And, um, you know, the the colleagues spoke about the importance of of the sdgs and how we're looking at this across all the sdgs and i and i fully fully endorse that because i think far too often we you know we we see a conversation uh, on on the issue of of climate as you know on, on one hand we say it's a it's a all of government approach but then we can find ourselves slipping into these siloed communities, you know, where we, we, we label ourselves as climate change actors, when really and truly it is about climate information and how the users are applying the climate information and the science, but in, in, a, in a very joined up and comprehensive way. And why you would have heard me made the point about central to all of this is risk. You know, it, it, is, it is how are we risk, vulnerabilities and exposure. You know, how are we looking across the spectrum of, at these issues, at the drivers behind the, you know, the, the climate altering actions, at our ability to be able to be resilient against it. It goes right back to addressing issues around risk, vulnerability and exposure. There's, you know, the famous equation we, we tend to use more aligned with, with disaster risk reduction, but it is, it is central to development. It is central to the conversation around climate. You know, um, it, it is, it is, you know, it, it is important that we understand that we need to build our capacity, re reduce our vulnerability, reduce our exposure, and by doing that, we're we're reducing the risk to our our efforts at achieving the sustainable development goals. And it is at the center of that is, you know, as 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 our colleagues spoke to, is is the need for us to join up our efforts across across government. So it's a systems approach because climate change is a systemic issue. And so if we're not all connecting to it, you know, as an ecosystem, you know, these are terms we use, but then we, we, we undervalue the thinking and idea behind how ecosystems function and the way we, as part of, of, of that, the natural order of things need to, need to work um, in that regard. I'm not trying to get too philosophical, but I think it's important that we, we connect these things, um, you know, very much as Frank is, is, is emblematic of. You know, that we are seeing ourselves as part of an ecosystem and we need to work in a joined up manner to ensure that we can survive into the next next hundred years and beyond. OK, thank you. Well, I'd now like to go to some questions. We've uh, we've got a little bit of time, a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, and I'm going to go to the one with the most votes at the moment, which has eight votes. Um, and it's from Yafet in Tanzania. And the question is, there is a critical lack of political will for climate action. How can citizens build this public and political will? 
Um, hmm, I don't know who would quite like to answer that first. You're asking me, and then I silence. Then you know. Uh, ah. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, I think citizens continue to sort of raise voice. I mean, you know, uh, if you look at Saudi Arabia, you know, it took 30 years for the climate negotiators to come to this stage, right? It was 1992 that the Convention on Climate Change was established. And after 30 years, here we are, where we are right now, taking a really strong actions. It might, might have taken much longer than anybody would have expected at the beginning. But then, you know, all the, that is because of the pressure by the, you know, all the, you know, society at large informed by the science and then pressured by the citizens. So uh, I do encourage everybody to continue to raise voice. At this point in time, no politicians in any part of the world will be able to run away from the fact climate is changing, we have to address it immediately. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ron, do you have anything to add? No, I, well, look, I think you're touching on a very important issue here in terms of how how are the voices of the many helping to shift you know the the policy decisions not just within the global space but also at the national level and uh, you know just just going back to my 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 previous days working in the Caribbean one of the things I, I often said was that we never saw issues around climate, and the way we, we, we see it manifesting in terms of, of catastrophes as an important issue on the ballot box. So, you know, how do we then link the, you know, these particular challenges to the everyday challenges we're facing? You know, the whole issue around, you know, um, inability to finance jobs, you know, education, innovation, um, you know, opening the, the opportunities for economic freedoms of our societies these are all linked to to the losses we're sustaining by virtue of these manifestations of of climate and climate sensitive hazards when they interact with development and until our citizens can link you know the the signs to the the day-to-day -day challenges they face and make this an issue enough on the ballot box then we won't see the sort of political impetus behind it that we need to see so as again, part of our, our work, um, you know, in the UN system as well, is how, how do we ensure that we put people in the center of the decision making process, um, ensure that we can raise people's voices around the advocacy as well on these particular issues. So just agreeing with my colleague, but also adding a little bit more in terms of, of, of how important this is in terms of getting political commitment and, and action. Okay, and the last question for this uh, for this particular section, uh, and do people send in uh, your questions also for the other sections? Uh, the next one we'll be talking about is youth and climate action, and then the climate science. Uh, so do keep sending in your questions in the Slido code you can see on your screen. And the question, last question for this part is uh, from Franca in Italy. Uh, which has got four votes, and it says buying fossil fuels, especially coal, seems necessary to curb global temperature rise. How do we convince countries to do this? Uh, so, uh, Minoru, uh, I think we should start with you. <laughs> yes, I think fossil fuels currently sort of occupies a significant portion of the energy system. And that sort of, of course, comes from the history of those things. Now that, you know, all the, all the eminence uh, is clear that we have to transition to the net zero on the or carbon neutral or the energy system, this is a time to have a very serious discussions. Uh, the, in many countries, voluntarily, they are already declaring that the coal is going to be phased out and transitioning into their new energy system. As I mentioned, the renewable energy system has become dramatically cheaper over the last decade. And then this is making a business case on its own, so you don't have to actually convince that much business community. This is where you know investment is happening, and green investors would like to sort of uh, then invest in the green on uh, green options. So automatically, this is getting me the sort of choice of the you know the technology of the choice. At the same time, many other countries still sort of obviously have a significant sort of challenges transitioning. This is where international cooperation is going to be continue to be useful. 
in that to be honest right you know or that we here in oecd country do use lots of fossil fuels and we continue to be using it so it is not just the sort of developing country which are facing the ch uh, challenges here uh, the developed countries too so we really have to have a global cooperation to support cop 26 you have seen that some countries and you know, all the trilateral arrangement you know co on in a couple of countries supporting specific countries transitions from coal and also moving into the renewables, for example. Those type of sort of cooperation, I would see that necessary. And this is where I think in the United Nations system, we need to continue to support facilitating dialogue. Now, specific options to go, go and do that, this is beyond my capability, but I know that John will be able to answer all the questions on this one. Okay, well, yes, John will be coming up later on to talk on the climate science part. Uh, Ronald, do you have anything quick to add before uh, we close this uh, section? Not, not particularly. I, I do believe, I mean, that it remains, whilst we've seen tremendous um, growth in terms of the ability now to deploy these types of, of solutions, in many instances, they still remain, the cost of them still remains prohibitive to at the individual level. And so I think there is, that's an area where we have to redouble our effort, um, not just in terms of external financing, but also you know, in terms of government policies and incentivizing the, the transition to renewable energy sources. Um, but, but also how do we find pathways to make sure that the, you know, it can be cheaper um, using innovation and, and perhaps looking at, at product, production closer to, to, to where we need to deploy some of these, these sources. So it's a mix, um, like my colleague, I'm, I myself, my, my DESA colleague, I my, myself, I'm, I'm not equipped with, with the answers to the pathways, but I, I do think that there's still more to be done. And this is an area, certainly we have to redouble the efforts coming out of the Glasgow Compact. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm going to leave this part of the discussion. Thank you both. And we'll be seeing you again at the final quick fire round of questions at the end. Thank you for that. So now our second subject that you uh, were the ones that chose to, that you wanted to hear next is climate and youth. Uh, and so climate action and youth. And of course, we've all noted the greater involvement and the louder voices of young people calling for climate action on the climate crisis. And we've seen their disappointment, frustration, if not rage, about the slow pace of change. In this section, we're going to be hearing the thoughts of a young climate activist. But first, I'd like to launch a poll. And the question this time is, which is the best way to make young people feel truly involved in global climate action? And then you have various options here. You can either give them a concrete role in policy making, listen to them, act on their suggestions and be accountable to them. And perhaps our next guest will talk a little bit about what she thinks of those options. Do send in your questions uh, and also tweet using the hashtag future of the world. And talking of social media, we're now going to hear from an eco reporter who goes by the social media handle, the eco feminist. Adenike Olodoshu is a young woman from Nigeria fighting for climate justice, climate government, and green democracy in her roles as ambassador for Earth Uprising and the African Youth Climate Hub. Welcome. Thank you so much. So, Adenike, how and why did you get involved in climate action in Nigeria? Okay, um, very well. You know, I, I schooled in the food basket of the nation, and that's where I am currently in Benue State, um, um, Nigeria. And I saw the first and impact of the climate change crisis as how it interferes with environmental instability between the farmers and the headsmen. And this is quite leading to um, affecting our diversity because people are in it from the angle of religion, political, um, ethnic crisis. And um, one of those things that I see climate change could lead to, because climate change, as we know, as we have known, 
it has no identity and that is where the complexity stems from so it can lead to ethno religious war in a country like mine in nigeria may change is already making our diversity to be fragile so little people are seeing it from the angle of environmental disaster and i saw that there's a low level of um, climate education that the fact that you're educated doesn't mean that you know much about your environment it takes another progress or another process for you to get involved in environmental issues to understand so i have this belief that you must first understand that the problem exists before you can solve um, or find solution to it. Because if you don't understand that the problem exists, there is no way you can provide solution and there is no way you can bring any um, solution. So after my um, graduation, I started educating people. I joined the Fridays for Future as the initiator in Africa. Then later I saw other young people. And why I, why I joined the movement, I want young people to be part of of the decision making of their tomorrow you know to be in the room and not outside the room where decision are making to be in the place where they could speak and their voice will be heard so far so good we have many people across the continent in africa trying to make their voice heard using the same platform different platform and the rest and that is what we want to see more young people coming to this space championing them climate action awareness solutions and the rest and so after then i got to establish the elite climate movement which now officially has here um, in nigeria in abuja trying to see how we can call for the restoration of lake chad because while i was an undergraduate student i saw an horrible incident i heard about it about the 276 school girls that were adopted in their school and I begin to wonder that what might have led to this. Then I researched and I saw that there's a shrinking lake chart that have been up affecting our peace and security. Then I started advocating for it because this is the step that we can do to get stability in the lake chart region if it is restored. And if we also have the Great Green Wall being established. So they are interlinked. The situation, the solutions are interlinked. And more, uh, more important too, I advocate for women and girls because I see that there's a great tie when we have a green democracy. A green democracy in such a way that we put the voice of our environment into our democratic processes because we have seen it with the COVID-19 that the environment now dictates what we wear, where we go, when we don't need to go out and the rest. So we have to include the environmental agenda into our democratic process in order to make it to balance, in order to reduce the rate at which people intrude into our environment that affects our species being in a Extinction and the rest, because we've heard it from the UNDP um, video that we just um, watched that we should not choose extinction because that is what is going to be the end thereof of humanity due to climate change if we don't act right now. And I see it's very important for me to keep in the space and to also bring more youth on the platform and to also get my voice being heard locally and globally. And through this means, um, I've been able to participate in COP processes, COP25, COP26, as a Nigerian youth delegate. So I'm happy to be here to share more insight about young people and climate action. Thank you. Hello. Hello? Hey, Amina, we don't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. You are muted. Hello. Aminda, we don't hear you. We don't hear you. You're muted. 
I'm so I'm muted. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I thought it was other people's problems, not mine. Uh, that's great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so what I was saying is, can we have a look at our poll and see uh, what um, what the audience said? Because uh, Adenike, you were saying that it's important to have a decision making uh, role and for young people to be in the room. And it seems like our poll uh, has actually agreed with you, which is good. Uh, we've got 50% saying give them a concrete role in policy making. Uh, then also be accountable to them and being accountable to young people, uh, listening to them and acting on them. But certainly that give them a a concrete role in uh, uh, chimes in with what you were saying. Um, so just going back, you said you went to COP25 and you've also been to COP26. What was your reaction uh, and the results of COP26? Uh, what did you feel came out of it? Yeah, I, I would say that um, it's not all, all about being pessimistic or optimistic right now. It's all about speaking about the reality of the situation of the climate change crisis, especially from um, the African lens, looking at what it, it already is. Because today, I went to um, a refugee camp, and honestly, it is not where you should be. It is not a decent place where they are living currently. And I rate um, the outcomes as something that it's not looking like the reality of ground the outcome doesn't tally with what is currently happening globally and in my home country it is just a very small part of the reality that we saw in the decision taking just like um looking at the um, climate finance of 100 billion dollars annually since 2009 down to 2020 of which it's not yet um it's not yet fulfilled and now they are now talking about making another climate finance from 2025 to 2030. You know, just delaying climate action. Why the climate change crisis keep increasing every minute, every day, every second, and it's not waiting for so expectedly worldly to bring up more of these feasible solutions and not solutions of 2060, 2050 or thereabout. Because the more we postpone climate action, it's like telling young people to take on the responsibility of what they never cost or what they are never responsible for. So I think I'm, uh, the COP26 has not been inclusive is enough of the reality of the climate change crisis that we are speaking on currently of the fact this is the first cop that the fossil fuel was mentioned but it was rather turned down but not phased out you know phased down but it is not something that we should be deciding or negotiating maybe we should turn out or turn or, um, down um, fossil fuel we already know that this is one of the major causes of the climate change crisis because looking at the Niger Delta crisis where um, one of the regions in Nigeria it's a very it, it's a human rights disaster right now because it's affecting their health education well-being their right to safe drinking water and the rest and we keep debating on whether the fossil fuels should be phased out or face down it's really an injustice onto us and i was expecting that of article 6 which was completed but how how long will this commitment become a reality that is the most important part of what i am looking at it is not all about completing article 6 it is not all about coming to talk about a glasgow uh, declaration or the rest it's about when we this commitment come to be the reality in our various country. How soon are we going to act on this commitment to make it a reality enough for the people? You know, there are quite a number of commitments we have today in various courts that are yet to be met. You know, it just stayed, it just started, it stayed there like and it remained in the conference. And when we come to our individual countries, nobody is talking about it, nobody is about it, because we are not working towards the leadership framework of trade you know most countries they are trying to deny climate action in the sense that postponing it to 2030 2050 it is not should it shouldn't be so 
what your leadership framework can give towards saving our planet you should be able to say that in um in conferences so that we will know where to hold you accountable and not postponing it into the future because that is the most dangerous thing to do right now okay thank you well we have a question for you um and then we're going to have to finish this part but this is a very interesting question unfortunately the person didn't leave their name um and it says why do you think so many youth climate activists are women and girls very good because <laughs> uh the face of the climate change crisis today we are seeing that um um, most leaders have also been propelled to act because we have young women leading the fight for the climate change uh, justice movement and it really strengthens the movement a lot because we are the one most led by the climate change crisis looking at the fact that we have limited or sometimes zero access to own in land and little access to energy because energy poverty is driving and girls to lose their rights to education you know to economic gain and the rest i'm looking at the fact that um, there is no access to other basic resources because you could imagine in sub sahara africa where i am from that women produce 60 to 80 percent of our food production you could now imagine if they are given total rights to own a land then it could help us to reduce poverty, hunger, and every other crisis in tackling the climate change crisis. Likewise, if we have um, access to energy, it will reduce the distance at which women and girls will have to go trek kilometers to get all of these cooking materials to stabilize their family. Rather, it will help them to be able to adapt to the climate change crisis, contribute their indigenous knowledge, and also had um, conservation practices and environmental protection that could also jointly help to tackle the climate change crisis so it's also very it resonates that's why we have uh, more women and girls that are championing this cause because we have been hit by the climate change crisis and we are not ready to step down any soon and we are not ready to take the backstage when it comes to us demanding for more climate action in various sectors Thank you very much indeed. And in fact, we'll be talking in a moment about agriculture as well, which ties in what you were talking about, the women's role of producing food in uh, in your particular region. OK, thank you very much indeed. We are now going to move on to the final subject, but we will be coming back again at the end. So if you have any questions uh, for Adeneke, uh, please uh, do uh, send them in and vote on them. Uh, you can get to the question uh, to the place where you can send in questions by uh, uh, scanning the QR code that you can see on the site. And of course, do spread the word on what you're hearing today using the hashtag future of the world. So now let's go to our final of our three topics before we then go to a quick fire question round with all our speakers. And this time we're going to be talking about climate science, which actually ties in with an awful lot of what we've already been talking about so far. Um, and we, we know that the science is telling us loud and clear uh, in from all directions that we must limit global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels. Of course, planet Earth will not disappear if we don't, but as we heard from Frankie the Dino earlier, uh, it will make our lives very difficult as human beings. Uh, so some critics of COP, as we've just heard, uh, say that um, we are failing to listen to the science. Uh, we're not acting quick enough, as the scientists tell us. And we now have three scientists with us to discuss this topic. Uh, and as before, I want to start with a quick poll. Uh, and the poll is what can be made, what can be done to make politicians and businesses act on the science? And you have various options, people pressure citizen engagement, tackle fake news, give young people a, rung, a, young, a role in decision making, or listen to people already affected. So I'm going to leave those open. Uh, for the moment, uh, and we'll have a look at the results in a minute. And while uh, we are letting you vote, I will uh, bring in our panelists for this final section. Uh, so we're going to be hearing from Sonali McDermid, 
uh, an expert in the interaction between climate change, land use and agriculture. We've got Joanna Post, who's representing the blue side of our green discussions, as her expertise lies in oceans. And we have John Christensen, who knows all about the gap between our promised emission cuts and what we're actually delivering. Uh, and so we didn't give you much time to vote on that, but I would like to close our poll and see what you think. So we had 24, 26 people voting and 35%, uh, quite interestingly, want people pressure citizen engagement. Uh, and then the other one is amplify the voices of people already affected. That's the second one. Um, so it's people pressure citizen engagement. That's, uh, that's interesting. Um, I would think I'm going to start by getting some reaction. Uh, uh, Sunali, as a scientist, how do you think we can persuade the decision makers to listen to you more? Do you think that uh, it's people pressure, citizen engagement that will really help? I love this question. C can you hear me properly? Yes. Yes. Fine. Okay. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, I love this question. Um, and I'm going to actually um, answer it um, acknowledging that citizen engagement um, and people pressure is extremely important, but pushing back against the idea that that's the only thing that's important. And part of the reason that I'm saying that is because we, there has been a trend to individualize this problem, to try to put this problem on the shoulders of individual citizens, right? Um, counting your carbon footprint, for example. Um, these aren't necessarily bad things, but they're not all either getting, they're not also getting at the, some of the core um, uh, issues that we're dealing with here. Um, and so I think in addition to citizen pressure um, and people pressure, um, there also needs to be, um, and I'll just say it, the regulatory will and the will to sort of rein in some of the forces that wind up contributing to this problem. And so, um, you know, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization um, recently co-authored a report looking at um, the application of agricultural subsidies um, globally um, and found that those subsidies were not consistent with environmental goals and perhaps even social justice goals that include the climate system. Um, so looking at the way that we incentivize, um, our governments incentivize um, and provide supports to some of the systems that, um, that are in place right now is important tax law. Um, uh, there's a new study that came out that looks at the intersection of tax law, um, the outsourcing of, uh, of, of revenue and tax havens, offshoring, right, of some of these responsibilities. Um, that also has implications for how monies are spent and how climate solutions are either valued or undervalued. Um, and I think citizens can make a big dent in this um, and this kind of comes back to Ron's point, um, I think a bit earlier, um, by actively um, uh, informing ourselves, right, about what our um, elections stand for in our, in our, uh, in our you know, democratic societies um, and ensuring accountability that they're, uh, you know, that we have the, the people in office that are willing um, to take these bold steps and address um, some of these systemic issues that rise above the shoulders of individual citizens and the accountability really lies at upper levels as well too. Um, and so I think that looking at it from that perspective, right, is an important, uh, it's an important and empowering um, uh, potential that we can leverage. about um, your specific expertise about agriculture. Uh, but first, Joanna, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, from, let's say, the point of view of the oceans, how are they affected by the warming cli climate? We've heard maybe some things, but maybe not all of the effects. Uh, thank you, and uh, pleasure to be with you all today. Um, so my role here at the Secretariat is actually one uh, that, joining the science and policy interface. So part of that is the ocean and the ocean is suffering. Uh, it, it is the driver of climate, is the driver of climate change and it's also suffering due to climate change, but it's also often not the first thing on people's agendas 
um, despite this uh, massive role it plays. And of course, it's 70% of our blue marble. I hasten to remind people we're a blue marble, not a green and brown and white one. Um, so it has a massive role to play. Um, and there's a lot of investment needed in, in better understanding that role. We know that the carbon cycle, for example, in the ocean is slowing down. So it is to, to date actually absorbed 90% of the energy of, of uh, climate change um, global warming due to anthropogenic emissions. We know it's um, absorbed 30% of carbon dioxide emissions. So it's in a serious state as far as warming is concerned, as far as oxygenation, deoxygenation and acidification is concerned. And of course, we know that the, um, the, the latent heat of the ocean is increasing, which is expanding the water. And that alongside glacier melt is, is causing sea level rise, which is going to be a it's not stopping, even if we stop at 1.5. So that there is issues around um, all of these things. And I think there's the, the area around uh, coastal zones where there's um, fishing, where there's ecosystem degradation, where we know there's massive degradation in coral reefs, um, where there will be a need for action, very strong action, is, is really a melting pot of, of understanding that the ocean is being affected by climate change and thus there needs to be serious ambition on climate change to protect the ocean as well as it's a place for action in terms of both mitigation action, citing power generation, uh, reducing fossil fuel emissions from shipping as well as protection of um, uh, green grey infrastructure and protection of ecosystems uh, along coastlines. Gosh, yeah, so it, it, it's, a, it's a huge uh, contribution and also suffering in a lot, but also with lots of possible, uh, let's say, positive benefits that we can actually use to help mitigate, as you say, store carbon, things like that, and uh, produce cleaner energy. Um, and of course, the thing with all of this that we're talking about, driving the changes on our land and in our seas, are the human emissions of gases that damage our climate. John, you're an expert in this area. In the light of what has been agreed at COP, uh, in the light of the promises made, and then let's see if they get delivered, where are we heading for in terms of temperature rise and how are we getting there? What's the time frame we're talking about? And what's the gap between promises and what we need to deliver? Sure, yeah, thanks a lot and thanks for the opportunity also. Uh, yeah, I mean, first a little bit about the gap that you're asking about. I mean, we, we do this sort of emissions gap report from the UN environment every year and launch it just before the COP meetings, essentially putting up sort of a red flag in front of the negotiators, telling them where we are right now and where we should be heading if we want to keep the one and a half or well below two degrees alive. That was the goals of the Paris Agreement. So what we looked at this year was, of course, the new submissions. A large number of countries have set in new climate plans. And uh, we sort of try to assess what does that mean? How much does it add to close the gap between where we are and where we should be heading? And it's, it's making a positive contribution. But I think in order to get to something that will keep us on track to one and a half degrees, we need really to increase the ambition we saw in Glasgow with five to seven times. It's far from sufficient. I mean, we're getting closer. And as I think Minora mentioned is in his intervention also, if you look at the plans and also look at these sort of long-term net zero plans that were quite a large number of countries came out with, if they're all fully implemented, I think that we are getting closer to two degrees in the long run. But I think with the current ones, we are more heading like 2.7. And that's definitely a world that we don't really want to live in. So it, 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 there's a need. And I think the, the take on the uh, Glasgow meeting in the beginning that we need to act much faster. Glasgow did OK on the basic things, but the ambition is too low and it really needs to accelerate very quickly. And if I can just echo something that uh, Sonali said before, I, said, I think when you look at these questions you put also in the poll, it's not a question about one or the other. It's a question about all of them. We need to do all the things that were in the poll, and I don't know which one is the more important one, but I think it's a good choice. And it's a little disappointing climate science coming at third priority of the overall, but that we have to live with. But uh, I mean, we really need to move on all these. And I mean, maybe a little bit of an example here, because beyond this kind of global work I do for the UN environment, I'm now starting in a sort of Danish think tank also. And we've been working with all the municipalities in the countries on climate plans. And we just had a municipal election yesterday for the whole country, of course. And you can really see climate is becoming an issue. 
many of them have climate committees now at the municipal level and so on. So it is really becoming something where you say the popular engagement, we also work with schools and young kids and so on in terms of understanding climate change. So you need that kind of pressure also. At the same time, of course, science need to inform them about what's really going on and how bad it gets and so on. But it's a combination of all the things. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, it is a combination of all those things. Uh, we, we were trying to put people on the spot to make them choose. But yes, of course, it's it, it's everything. Uh, so now, I wanted to ask you, because we touched on um, agriculture earlier on, we heard from uh, Adenike talking about uh, how the role of women and girls in um, in producing food. How is agriculture affected by climate change? Yeah, I think that was a very important point that Adenika made, um, and it's affected by climate change in, in in many different ways, right? I think we can visualize um, climate extremes like prolonged droughts, um, and I think I saw in the polls flooding. Um, you can couple that with coastal systems and the sea level rise that Joanna talked about and the increasing salinization of soils in some places. In other places, um, we have heat extremes and increasing heat stress that might lead eventually to even further drawdowns of the water table um, as people start to resort to, to um, uh, an over-reliance or increasing reliance on irrigation. Um, in addition to that, um, we have things that we problems and uh, risks that we still don't fully understand completely, but we know are on the horizon. And this can be increasing weed pe uh, pressure, pests and diseases that are mobilizing and moving um, uh, uh, moving um, to higher latitudes, for example, as a result of changing climate conditions, changes in the growing season. Um, I could go on and on, right? So it's not just the temperature and precipitation, but all of the other ways that this is being impact, um, that climate change change can, can impact agriculture. Um, I'll also add that in addition to climate change, um, there are other impacts on agriculture that result from our own management practices. Um, the overapplication of nutrients, for example, the drawdown of um, soil biogeochemistry and soil fertility as a result of intensive cropping systems um, or intensive agricultural systems. Um, and so there are compounding uh, pressures um, that result both from climate change and indirectly from other human uses and human pressures that complicate adaptation um, uh, and potentially mitigation. Um, and so these are um, all risks that we, we need to be targeting and we need to be doing it in a number of ways, not just with technologies and biophysical improvements, but also with financial mechanisms, um, uh, changes in markets, access to markets, um, and agency and sovereignty um, that, that, farmers, um, that farmers should possess. As everything with climate change, you know, there's so much involved and so many different aspects to it. Um, I would like to actually, we've got some time, so I just want to quickly uh, look at a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one that's actually got the most votes, and I'm not quite sure uh, if you're able to uh, answer this, anyone from our, our panel, but it's it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say, uh, which is uh, from uh, Jacinto uh, in Ecuador, and it says, how do we include more indigenous knowledge in climate solutions? Because obviously indigenous knowledge, there are people on the ground who know the climate better and who've had many years uh, to actually do, uh, to, to work on the land. Um, uh, Joanna, what do you think? Yes, I, I can answer this. And actually, um, I think just a reflection before I do answer the question in that a lot of people um, talk about the problems that science has identified. But I think there is a, a really must be recognized this paradigm shift that came with the Paris Agreement that science, there's enough science to act now. And the, the role of science is, of course, to, to look at things that we don't yet understand, but it's also there to help answer questions. Um, and there's a huge knowledge base already out there, but it just needs a bringing together of, you know, dialogues in some ways and bringing together of people to, to help answer these questions, to respond to these 
needs in terms of adaptation and mitigation. And that is actually also where, where the indigenous knowledge is also an important part of that, that conversation. And it's there is a, a now it's well recognized under the UNFCCC work. There is a um, local community and indigenous peoples platform under the UNFCCC. And there's a facilitative working group that's helping bring this knowledge into the UNFCCC process. So that's certainly at the international level, it's well recognized and there's some results coming out of Glasgow that, that deepen that and strengthen that engagement. Certainly on the side of the science, um, which I lead here also is alongside the, the ocean links, um, there, there is of course engagement around um, bringing uh, this knowledge into the conversation. And it's also being developed in the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change who assess all of the science. There's conversations there now talking about how, how to bring um, indigenous knowledge into the, into the conversation at the international level. I can speak to that at the local level, of course, there's, there's other people working very strongly to, to bring that in knowledge and, and, and co-produce information together. Um, and that's recognized, of course, as well with the strengthening coming out of COP of, of the, the, um, the importance of biodiversity protection and nature protection as well. Um, so, so, so just uh, that's sort of some of the work that's going on to bring that knowledge in, into, it, it, to broaden really how we view scientific knowledge. It, it's, it's also indigenous knowledge as well. Thank you very much indeed. Also, it's worth uh, noting that we are in the middle of the UN decade of ocean science, uh, where there's also a whole uh, thing going on trying to feel- Just in starting the actually. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be very important uh, and obviously the indigenous knowledge yeah. will be feeding into that as well I'm sure and um, I've got one quick question uh, and I'd like to put this one to John uh, and this one is from Jim uh, in uh, Edinburgh the UK and he says how do you feel of article 6 the future of article 6 of the Paris agreement on carbon markets now let's not go into uh, all the detail and everything uh, let's try and keep it broad broad here uh, but what's uh, what's your reaction to that john yes thanks no i won't get into details i hardly understand all of it myself to be honest but but uh, it uh, it's important in the sense that if you look at the national climate plans, the indices that have been submitted both in Paris and the new ones here for Glasgow, the number of countries who are sort of counting on using market mechanisms and achieving the targets has almost been doubled. And it's, it's probably more than half of the countries who are looking to market mechanisms. So I think it is important that we did get agreement finally. It's been an issue that's been dragging on now for two or three cups. And uh, I think the, the sort of effect will still remain in the details because a lot of technical issues need to be negotiated. We had a chapter about market mechanisms in, in the GAP report this year because of the negotiations, of course. And uh, I mean, what we emphasize is that, I mean, it, it needs to be critically important that it's not opening up for sort of hot air or fake credits or whatever the terminology might be, that the rules are strict, that you are transparent in terms of delivering and you can sort of account them. And also that you build it in a way so that it contributes to increasing the ambition, not just sharing the current ambition between countries in a different way, but really use it to increase the ambition because otherwise it doesn't really add anything. So it's really about the integrity of the work, but I think it's an important part also to bring the private sector more into the action. And there has been a lot of interest in bringing it on. So let's see how it develops, but I think it's a good positive first step. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to wrap up this uh, climate science section uh, and I'm going to ask, uh, thank our speakers for this one, but ask all the other speakers, let's see, let's get everyone in because we're now going to have our quick fire round of questions uh, and get in as many as possible. So uh, we'll keep the questions short and uh, hopefully keep your answers nice and succinct as well. Uh, so our first question uh, that I'd like to go to, which has the most votes at the moment, um, out of 30 questions that we've got uh, lined up for us, we're not going to fit them all in now. Sorry about that, everyone, but hopefully we've answered quite a few. Uh, this one's from Azar in Islamabad, and it says, why are countries reluctant to have bind legally binding agreements if they are serious about 1.5C? If not Paris, what else would work? So who would like to answer that one? Everyone's looking puzzled. Okay, John? 
And Joanna? I mean, I, I can, well, I'm not sure I can answer it, but I can give at least one sort of view on it, which I think is very, uh, was very imminent in Glasgow also, is that, I mean, in the UN processes, and, and all my UN colleagues can confirm that, I mean, it's, it's a consensus process. So you need to bring everybody along and everybody needs to agree on everything. And of course, there are very different interests between different types of countries and different level of development, income, and so on. So I think what we saw very much in Glasgow is that that is moving on the core parts, like what we just talked about on the Article 6 and the other things that needed to be settled. But at the same time, there are countries who are willing to move faster and they come together in coalitions around different issues. And they kind of, I wouldn't say overtake the process, but then support the process by doing more individualized action. I mean, we had one, for instance, on methane pledge where you go out and say, okay, these more than 100 countries now commit to doing something on methane. And you had something on forestry, you had a number of initiatives like that. So I think that is pushed by the process, but it also accelerates the process in a sense. And you don't have to wait for everybody to agree, but you can actually move on. And then hopefully over time, you can bring more and more in. So I think it's, it's, it is a mixture of the two things. I don't think you can do without the consensus process because the, the other things wouldn't happen. But I think it's also fair that you can sort of overtake the process and do more and get credit for that outside. I can also then try and feed in and, and speed up the process. Joanna? I think John covered a lot of what I would say. Um, I would respond to the, the, the question, the person who asked the question by saying, yes, Paris, um, let's, not, let's not renegotiate. Um, we have a very strong agreement with the Paris Agreement that took a long time coming and it was a massive breakthrough and it's shifted the paradigm and shifted the conversations. And I think we should celebrate that. Um, but as John said, the, the, the UN process, the UNFCCC process itself is a very slow moving because of this need for, for consensus across all parties. You know, everyone has to agree to whatever comes out as a decision. So we, we need to recognize that. But at the same time, the Paris Agreement has set these very clear modalities for things to work. But I invite all of those mm. online to, to now sort of, um, you know, use that, use that Paris um, framework to, to motivate, to, to vote. Uh, for those people who are, um, you know, uh, in your country doing the right things for, for the climate and for pushing this. There's, of course, a lot of countries already recognizing the importance of net zero at 2050, and some have, 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 many have, have made that a very public event. But also there needs to be a build up of recognition that to get to net zero, things need to be done, you know, in the short term, not just an aspiration for a long term. And I think that could be encouraged a lot more um, and there are ways that scientific information and, and others need to work together to, to build that uh, in, in, in individual countries so that it can meet their Paris targets. Thank you, Joanna. I've got a question uh, that is definitely talking about building support and action and moving faster and further. Um, I've got a, a question for Adenike. Um, in terms of youth involvement, there's a need for more youth empowerment, yet organisations lack young people in employed positions. How can we address this? So young people are not employed in jobs and so they don't have enough empowerment and they don't have a voice. Do you think that's a problem? Adenike, can you hear me? Okay, your screen maybe has frozen, so I think uh, we'll go to the next question, but if it's back, I certainly want to hear you on that. If anyone uh, wants to talk about uh, young people and jobs in position of employment, employment. Um, no, we'll, well, we'll wait for hopefully Adenike to uh, unfreeze her camera. What a shame. Uh, unfortunately, infrastructure is not always as it should be, as we know. Uh, right, let's go to uh, a question from Jeremy Millard from Denmark. And he says, how do we change hearts and minds so we reach a tipping point that flips behaviour broadly? How can we do this and who should do it? Hmm. Ron? Those are, those are very tough questions, you know? I mean, even as I listened to the first, the first one posed, 
about how do we how do we get behavior change and you know it, it just led me to think about you know when it comes when it comes around to 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 giving up something what are we willing to give up you know and 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 similarly when we look at our or countries and 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 their own ambitions towards prosperity i think the 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 fear of commitment is very much linked to a sense that we are giving up something that may impact or or prosperity going forward so i think I, I think these questions are quite difficult in terms of how do we change um the you know it's always about what will we lose what will we gain um, and if we start to ask ourselves that question individually, what do we lose? What do we gain if at the individual level we give up some of our unsustainable practices? And how do we use that as, as you know, building the, the momentum, the snowball, so to speak, for greater change at different levels um, of the system, all the way up to, to you know, sort of the, the, the country level and hopefully the global level? It's just a difficult question, really. Um, but I think that's where I would start. It starts individually with us trying to determine what are we willing to commit to and how does that you know, pivot into um, collective action? John, very briefly, because we're going to have to start wrapping up things now. Yeah, we'll try to be brief. I just want to pick up on what Ron just said, but maybe turn it around. Because I think what is really needed in the climate space, and some people are able to do it, but but to have a positive vision about where we're heading, you may have to give up things, but you're actually moving into a nicer, greener, more sort of comfortable world in many ways. You're going to have renewable power, you're going to drive electrical cars over time, and so on. I mean, there are lots of things where you can articulate it in a positive manner, because it's been this reductionist approach, and I don't think anybody wants to be reduced. You need to have something where you can see about a good place to go. And that vision, I think, is often lacking. OK, thank you very much indeed for all of our speakers. Uh, and we're now unfortunately coming to the end. I, I can't believe how fast the time has gone. Uh, and uh, we've had a great discussion. Uh, we've, we've touched on a lot of different topics. Of course, we could touch on many more. But thank you for your expertise uh, sharing that with us today. And it's a real shame that Adenike, her line dropped off so we couldn't hear her back at the end. Um, but thank, thanks to her as well. And hopefully if you've heard what she was speaking about earlier, you can be sharing that on social media using the future of the world hashtag. Um, so in the meantime, I, I'd like to thank the organizers from the UNDESA and UNDP for bringing us together to discuss this important topic. And of course, thanks to all of those behind the scenes who made it work so well. This event's going to be archived on the UNDESA Facebook page at facebook.com join UNDESA. So if you want to rewatch it or share it with other people, you can do that immediately after this live event has finished. And you can find out more about the Future of the World series of policy briefs and dialogues on un.org stroke DESA. And that brings us to the end of the discussion. Thanks again to our speakers for their contributions and to you, the audience, for joining our event over Zoom and on Facebook, for participating in our polls and sending in and voting on questions. Those of you watching on Zoom will see an exit survey pop up when you leave the meeting. Please do spare a couple of moments to fill it in because we're really interested to get your feedback. Our next event will be on the 15th of December, and it'll be about the future of trust government. I do hope that you can tune in for what looks like a very interesting discussion to come. Thank you for your attention. And this is me, Aminda Lee, signing off and wishing you a good rest of the day and evening.